the emergency room so just can keep him in your prayers as well uh, we've got a lot of people connected to the church that we need to be praying for several that are sick you might if you're in house and you've got a prayer request let me know by lifting your hand god knows every need let's all stand if you've joined us on live feed if you've got a prayer request text the keyword prayer to 205-642-8744 let's go to god in prayer and ask god to touch and minister in our Bible study tonight. Dear kind and gracious Heavenly Fathers, we come to you today. Again, thank you for the blessings that you've given us. Thank you for a beautiful day. We thank you for what you've done in our lives and what you're going to continue to do. God, tonight I pray that you'll touch and minister to every aspect of our service. God, you see those that are in their kids in the kids' class, the teens, the young adults, those that's here in the Bible study, in the sanctuary, those that are in-house and live feet alike. Father, I pray that you'll just move and minister in a mighty way to every heart and every life that's represented here today. God, I thank you for what you've done in our midst and what you're going to continue to do for us. In Jesus' precious name we pray, amen and amen. Let's give God a hand clap of praise and let's worship in song tonight. Amen. I thought we would just sing some songs of praise tonight and thanks to Jesus. Amen. Just since we're in this Thanksgiving uh, season, I think you'll know these as some good old gaper songs. Let's just praise the Lord. Let's just praise. We 
we just want to thank him for being so good. Amen. Again, thank you so much for being in the house of God tonight, being in the presence of the Lord. Amen. God is good all the time. God is good. Amen. You know, and just a few moments ago, I just read the I just read the the read the article. There's another uh, uh, another part of an attack that's going on right now overseas. Another another attack just took place. Um, just got the alert that it just it just happened over in Israel area. If you go back and you start looking at everything that's happening, and you start looking at at what's taken place, and you start thinking about these things. Uh, uh, and I've already told you that I had somebody, um, this is before the Israel situation started, somebody texted me and asked me, where are we at in Revelation? And and I honestly, I thought they was talking about, Sister Nelly, I thought they was talking about, I thought they thought that we were still studying Revelation, and I started to text them, uh, we finished that about a year or so ago, I mean, but, and then I realized that's not what they was meaning by that. And uh, I said, I said, well, I said, I guess we're, the, we're in the right here part of Revelation. Uh, it, it's a, it was amazing going through Revelation and seeing, going through and studying that on Sunday afternoons like we was doing. And you'd read something and y you almost could have said, hey, that happened last week. That happened yesterday. And I remember when I studied Revelation the very first time, it was some of those things was, you know, jumping off the page at you. And I was like, I'll never see those things happen. And then now, I'm, you know, go back, you know, when we did Revelation, and I was like, that happened yesterday. That happened last week. And you're just like, wow. And then you look at, you look at the world, you look at what's going on in the world, you look at the things that's going on right now in Israel, you look at the things in, 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 in the Gaza Strip, you look at the things about Hamas, you look at the things that's happening in the United States of America, you look at the, the pro-Palestine and the pro-Hamas, the pro-Israel uh, protests that are going on, then you see the riots that are taking place, you see the things that's happening all across our nation, and you really, you, you just stop and you look and you think, rapture's fixing to take place. And I don't know, some people, I don't know if they, they, they just, Brother Emery, they've heard that for so long. I don't know if it's just that they're, well, I've, I've heard it all my life. It's all right. It's almost, almost the boy who cried wolf. We keep saying the rapture's fixing to take place, the rapture's fixing, fixing to take place, and then, you know, it's been saying that for 2,000 years, the rapture's fixing to take place. And some people may look at it from that sense of, well, that's it's like the boy cried wolf. But we need to understand the rapture's fixing to take place. We also need to think about it in this aspect. We need to, we need to be careful the things that we do on a day-to-day -day basis. We need to be careful of what we, what we do, what we say, how we act. Because literally the rapture is fixing to take place. And and I'm not trying to be hyperbole. I'm not trying to be all super spiritual. I'm not trying to be uh, anything but what I am. I would hate to know. And people will say, oh, God's a loving God. He wouldn't do what you're fixing to say. You know what? I'm not going to risk it. I'm not going to chance it. I would hate to know that I've, I've, I have served God all these years. And I know I'm just a baby. To, you know, I've, I, I keep getting told that several people, you know, but I know I'm still real young. Uh, but, you know, I'd hate to know that I've served God. Uh, I've, pre I've been preaching for almost 30 years now. I started preaching when I was 15 years old. I've been, and, and next year I'll be 45 years old. And I'd hate to think that I have served God these, these number of years. I'd hate to think that I've, I've, I've served God this amount of time. Somebody gave me a, a, a questionnaire, and, and, and one of the questions on there was, you know, something along the lines of, when did you get called into ministry? Tell me about that. And I had, to, I had to lean back in my chair, and I had to think for just a moment. And I was like, man, I ain't thought about this in a minute. And so I, you know, brought that back. But, you know, thinking about those things, thinking about all the stuff like that, and I'm thinking, I would risk messing up 
and missing the rapture just because of pleasure or fleshly pleasure or, or a sinful desire or whatever. Oh, God wouldn't do that to you. I don't believe that God would hold against us if we, you know, it was a, I'm not going to say accident, let's just say it like that. But if I purposefully, that's where I'm looking at, okay, if I lied to somebody, it was not on purpose. Y'all, y'all know the, there's a difference, the intent of the heart, right? If Stan tells me that it's sun shining outside and I don't know that it's not, because, you know, it's, it's 644, it should still be sun shining outside. And Stan says it's sun shining outside, and I go over here and I tell Sister Nellie, it's still sun shining outside. Did I lie? It, I was not in the intent of my heart was not to lie. I was, and it was not that that Stan misled me. It wasn't. I'm not. I don't know if he did or didn't. You know, he may not. He may have. He may have heard it was sun shining uh, outside from Kevin. I don't know. But you. But you get my point. If I willfully intended to sin, I would hate to know that that I willfully intended to sin and I missed the rapture. And I've, I've been preaching for almost 30 years. Do you get my point here? And, oh, Brother Andy, the Bible says, I don't think God would ever do that. Well, he that knoweth to do right and doeth it not, it is a sin. That's what the Bible says, right? And so we, we stop. You know, with everything that you see on the news, everything that you see going on in Israel, everything that you see going on in our own backyard, you see the things happening right here in America, the things that's happening right here in, the, in Alabama, the things that's happening right here in, in St. Clair County, you see the things that are going on, you see the things happening, and you know that the Bible is unfolding right before our eyes, and you're thinking, wow. So the question that comes to our minds sometimes is, how do we get up in the morning and face the future? How do we face the future? How do we continuously face the future? Some of us, some are going to have to get up in the morning. Some may get up at 5. Some may get up earlier than that. Don't call me if you do. And, and some, some may get up later. But don't. <laughs> but, you know, some, you know. And you got to get up in the morning, you're going to get up, and you're going to go to work, you're going to go back. But how do we face the future knowing today the rapture could take place? How do we face the future not knowing what's going on in the, in the world that we live in? We don't know when our time is going is, is gonna to be called. We don't know. I don't know if, if tomorrow... I, you know, I've got a meeting up here at the church at 8.30, and I'm going to walk out the door because I've got such a long commute to work. Um, uh, you know, I walk out the front door at 8.29 and 35 seconds and be here in 35 seconds and, and 25 seconds. But, you know, I don't know if if I walk out my door at 8.25 in the morning if that's the last time I'm going to see my family before the rapture takes place. I mean, you really stop and think about that. I mean, I don't know if you think these things. I do. I really do. And and somebody told me, said, well, don't worry about it. You're going to see them in, in heaven. Well, that's great and wonderful, but if I really thought that that was going to be the last time that I would see them, if I really knew that the rapture was going to take place at 832, the 830 meeting will just have to hold itself. They can sit in their car. I'm going to stay at the house until the rapture takes place. Are you with me on this? And so, but, and I'm going to walk out into the cemetery right as it happens because I want to see the, I want to see that. I really, I do. I mean, I'm just really, I really want to see that. I'm just, I'm just real with you. Somebody else said, does it bother you living next door to the cemetery? No, because that's right where I want to be when the rapture takes place. <laughs> but, but all of these things, it's sort of, it, to me and in my mind, some of you already thought I've got have lost my, my last marvel. Y'all thought I'm, I'm crazy as a, as a Betsy bug now. But I stop and I think about these things, and we try to figure out about facing the future. So I want to, I wanna, there's four, th- four views that I want to I wanna talk about really quickly, and then we're going to start talking about facing the future. But there's four things I want to talk about 
before we get there because I want us to understand there's four ways we can look at this. There's four ways we can look at all that I've just summed up. There's four ways that we can look at these things. One, we can look at the future. We can look at facing the future. We can look at these things uh, from a pre-terrorist view. What this, and I'm going to, some of these words, I ain't going to say these right, but I'm going to explain what they mean, and it, it, it's, it's better than even the word itself, okay? John writes the book of Revelation. He writes it to encourage Christians of his day and John's day. He writes to encourage the Christians of John's day that are experiencing persecution from the Roman Empire. What we've got to do is we've got to take the Word of God, take Revelation, take the end time prophecies. No, I'm not doing end time prophecy per se. I'm talking about facing the future, but whenever you look at that, you look at Revelation. What we need to do in this, we need to, we take that kind of a view and we look at to gain an encouragement, the same kind of encouragement that John's first readers gained from the vivid images of God's sovereignty. You know, think about this. I, I remember the first time that I ever read certain books. Now, I really like to read. I really love books. Somebody has asked before, what is my, what is my weakness? Some, and, and somebody said, well, it's probably your daughter batting her eyes. No, nope, that's not my weakness. I can tell her no batting her eyes just as easy as I can anything. That stuff does not faze me. My weakness is books. I love books. I, you know, I'll be real with you. I've, I've got books I've never even opened, I, but I got them just because I love books. I love books. But think about this. I remember how it felt the first time I read The Hiding Place. Okay? It was a really powerful book. It was really a moving story. It was really uh, is a story of something that really happened, and it was really powerful to me to read that book, okay? Some have different books that are something, and I know that we all know that the Bible is a book, and I'm trying to, I want to I wanna use an example. Oh, you can't do that. I want to use an example that's not the Bible for what I'm fixing to use, okay? So the hiding place, I really, I remember reading that the very first time. So think about how you felt the first time you read whatever book it was. Some of you may have been Sports Illustrated. Uh, but whatever really great story that it was that you read, remember how you felt. Now, think of how the folks in John's day, think about the folks after John that read parts of Revelation when he wrote it read that for the very first time. Think about how they felt. The, the, the imagery, the, 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 the things that was happening there, and the sovereignty of God. Think about how those folks felt. And then think about how we today, 2,000 plus years later, that Christ walked on earth, we read the stories out of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John about Jesus and how he you know, people say, well, what would Jesus do? You better be careful how you ask that question because uh, turning tables over and bringing a whip out is not be off the table, okay? Because that's what Jesus did. People say, oh, you got to love how Jesus did. Well, Jesus didn't act like he loved some folks. So them he didn't. Do you, do you see what I'm saying? Because uh, I don't know about you, but if somebody comes after me with a whip, I really don't think they like me. Forget the love part. I don't think they like me. <laughs> but he was doing that because he loved them, and he was trying to clean the Father's house. We know this. But the thing is, is we've got to understand the, the view of, the, of, of, of prophecy, the view of those stories is powerful. The sovereignty of God is very powerful. But what we don't need to do is we do not need to forget that most biblical prophecy has an immediate and a future application. We need to remember that most of Bible prophecy used to, we could say, had not happened yet. But now we look at it as some things that we read Bible prophecy 
life has a future application. The things have not taken place. There's also a futurist view. Except for the first three chapters, John is describing events that is occurring at the end of history, the end of mankind. When John wrote Revelation, he's not writing as a current day events. We pick up the newspaper, we pick up, uh, we, we, we watch it on the news. Those are current day events and John wasn't writing a current day event book. He was writing something that some might would put in science fiction, but he was writing something that is going to happen in the future. And the challenge is, is to see contemporary events in many of the characteristics that John describes and realize we've got to look at the word of God is realize the end could come any time. The end could happen at any moment. I told so I, I was I was preaching a revival service one time and and I and I I I, I said I, I woke people up really when I did this. I said I said think about this. Not that I've ever gotten excited preaching. I said, think about this. The rapture could take place in five, four, three. Oh, my goodness. When I was, I know you can't laugh at that, in that revival service. And when I got down to one, I seen this poor little soul on the second row done that number bounce themselves <laughs> they was like okay God <laughs> you did don't forget me uh, but but think about that the things that we read in the word of God is we need to remember that these things are taking place and the end could happen at any moment don't assume that we've got it figured out Jesus said no man knows the day or the hour People will ask me, well, what order do you think Revelation is going to take place? <laughs> In God's order. People will say, well, it's going to take place on this time. Okay. That's your opinion. I have no idea. Well, you, you're a preacher. You're a pastor. You should know. <laughs> okay. I don't. I have an assumption. I have an opinion about what I think might would take place. One, two, three, and four. There are things that we can read out of the Word of God, and we know it's going to take place. One, two, three, and four. But I really don't know. I don't fully know what order things are going to take place, and so we don't need to really, we don't need to think that we know what's going to happen and when it's going to happen. But there's a history, a historic point of view. The book of Revelation is a presentation of history from John's day. From John's day until the second coming of Jesus Christ. The challenge in looking at it from that point of view is simply this. We need to note the consistency of man's evil throughout history and recognize that names may change, but the rebellion against God has not. We need to understand, people in Bible times rebelled against God. Guess what? People tomorrow are going to rebel against God. That has not changed. This past Sunday, for Sunday in Sunday school, we was talking about some aspects of current modern day events and aspects of current modern day life. And, and Brother Kevin, I brought it out this way. I said, guess what? These things are not new those things that we think are new, that we think are here, we think are right now, this is only a 2023 issue, guess what? They was going on in Sodom and Gomorrah. They was going on in Bible times, and we need to understand that rebellion against God is not a new thing. Man finds new ways of doing it, but it's not a new thing. The challenge that we come into in looking at it with a historic point of view is we need to be careful before identifying current events as fulfilling aspects of the book of Revelation. And what I mean by that, I had people to tell me that was going to be the Antichrist. I've had people to tell me was going to be the Antichrist. Okay? 
I've had people to tell me that it's going to be the Antichrist. I've had people to name people and say, But the thing is, is I don't know who anybody is going to be. And we've got to make sure that we're careful not to jump on that bandwagon. Does that make sense? Do you remember, and it's been some years ago, do you remember the guy in California that he said the rapture was going to take place on X date? He gave the date and the time. And there was people all across, Brother Larry's shaking his head and grinning. He knows exactly what I'm talking about. There was people all across America. And I know it's happened multiple times, but this one sticks out in my, my mind because he, he had people convinced the rapture was going to take place on this date, this time. And he had people, he had this family in New York. He had people all across America like this, but this one particular story that I read, it, it just it, it stuck with me all these years. It, he had this family in New York so convinced, so convinced that the rapture was going to take place on that date and that time. They sold everything they had. They had a they had a two million dollar home. They sold everything they had. They cashed out their kids' college fund. They quit their jobs. That's just going to take place in six months. What do they need that job for? They sold that $2 million home, cashed out kids' college fund. They got, they got enough money to last them six months. They bought a motor home, and they started traveling the nation from New York, making their way to California, and buying billboards every town and every city they went into, and telling, and it, I, re, I seen one of the billboards. It was so, it was comic, it's comical to us as Christians, because we know, I knew when the rapture wasn't going to take place. <laughs> <laughs> that date and that time, you know what I'm saying? And so they bought billboards across America stating rapture's going to take place this date, this time, you better get ready. Well, the only message on that that I really supported was you better get ready. And so they arrived at this man's, I mean, this was this is hundreds of, hundreds of thousands of people. They start making their way to California, and they arrived at this man's bunker. I didn't say house, I said bunker. And they beat on the bunker door, the, you know, the day after, you know, because the rapture didn't take place. And they're beating on the door, they're beating, they're trying to get into this bunker. I don't know whatever took place. I might need to Google that and figure that out. I don't ever know what, I don't know what took place, but these people was trying to find this guy. I think they was not wanting to have a happy birthday party with him. I mean, I think that some of them was going to whoop snot out of him, you know what I'm saying? But. Shame on them for thinking this. But more so, shame on the church for not teaching the truth. Hello? More so, shame on the church for not teaching the truth. Oh, Brother Andy, you can't say that. Oh, yes, I can. Because I've been in the church my whole life. And I also know that there are times that church folks will not teach and preach the truth because they're afraid it's going to run off people. But let's be more particular. They're afraid it's going to run off a dollar. Well, let's be real. Come on. But I know, I know that as long as I'm preaching and teaching the truth of the Word of God, God's going to take care of me. You know what I'm saying? And so, but we, but that's a lot of folks. They're not going to teach and preach the truth because they're afraid to run somebody off. But we, there's also the idealistic view. Of facing the future. The idealistic view is. We look at the book of Revelation. As a symbolic representation. Of the continual struggle. Of good and evil. It doesn't refer to any particular. Historic event. And is applicable. At any point in history. Guess what church. There's a struggle between good and evil. There's a struggle going on right now. In the heavenlies. Between good and evil. There's a battle over your soul. There's a battle over your soul. Do you know what I? Do you know what I've never heard a a, a a a robber say? I have never heard a robber 
Never heard a robber say, I'm going to break into an empty house to steal something. Never heard that. A robber will only break in to a place that they know there's something of value at. Is that correct? Does everybody agree with that? Okay. What does the Bible, what does the Bible refer to the devil as? A thief, a robber, seeking whom he's going to devour. The devil is not going to mess with you if he doesn't know there's something of value there to get. He messes with you because he knows your soul is of value. Okay? There is a battle over your soul. There's a battle of good and evil over your soul right this moment. Right now, there's a battle going over your soul. Brother Andy, Brother Andy, there's not a battle going on over my soul. I'm saved. What? Glory to God. I know it. And I am too. But there's a battle going on over my soul. Why? Because the devil don't like me. So we've got to realize that. We've got to realize that there is a battle going on in the heavenlies. We've got to read the word of God and gain insight into the past, the present, and the future. We've got to read the word of God to gain insight over what's happened in the past. Guess what? If it happened in the past, it's going to happen again. We find that right now, you open your eyes and look in Israel, you find the same thing happening over and over and over again. Somebody somebody asked me the other day, well, it's a couple of weeks ago now, asked me, said, you reckon, you reckon somebody will just wipe Israel off the planet, off of the map this time? I said, I can answer that with one word, nope. Well, why, what makes you say that? I said, because the moment somebody thinks they're going to wipe Israel off the map, y'all better get ready. You might as well go ahead and start jumping up in the air because the rapture is fixing to take place and snatch us all out of here. Because God's not going to let that happen. You hear what I'm saying? And so we've got to realize and understand what happened is going to happen. Does that make sense? We've got to prepare for the future. But we also must understand something. We do not need, do not avoid the book, the word of God, the book of Revelation, because it's difficult. I do tell Christ, new Christians, I said the word new Christians, did everybody hear the word new Christians, all right. I do tell new Christians, I tell them. They'll say, I had this one guy, y'all, this is no joke. This guy was convinced before he even talked to me to begin with where he was going. Uh, he wasted mine and his time. It was a Sunday evening service. It was after Sunday evening service. Sunday evening service was over with. And I was sitting there and I was exhausted. I don't know about you. I, I'm going to tell you something. After a service, I'm exhausted. Okay. It, it, people don't realize the draining that, that, that preaching and teaching does. It, it's exhausting. And so I was sitting there and I was wiped. This gentleman comes to me after a service at another church. It wasn't here. And, and he comes to me and he says, I need to talk to you. I said, okay. I said, I'm not getting up. You can sit down. I'm not getting up. I'm, I'm tired. I'm wore out. And, and so he sits down right across from me and he says, uh, he says, I want to get back into the Bible and I want to start reading. I said, wonderful. That's a great thing to do. He said, where do you think I need to start reading? I said, well, if I was you, I'd read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and then the book of Psalms. That's what I would do. He said, well, I want to read Revelation. I said, well, I'm, I'm telling you, you need to read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and the book of Psalms. He said, but preacher, I want to start reading the book of Revelation. I said, okay, but I'm telling you, I would read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and the book of Psalms. But what if I want to start in the book of Revelation? I said, then jump for it. Jump, frog, or jump. I said, that was my words. I said, jump, frog, or jump. He just sort of looked at me awful funny. He said, well, I'm here asking your opinion. I said, I've told you three times. Why do you keep repeating yourself? I said, I would not start there. I discourage new Christians from starting in the book of Revelation. I don't discourage seasoned Christians. We need to read the book of Revelation. It's good to read the book of Revelation. 
I had somebody text me the other day and said, can you text me the link to all the videos that you did on the study of the book of Revelation? I said, sure. I texted them the link. Bam. I'm like, good luck. I'm thinking, oh, Lord, help me. I'll hear something now. But here's the thing. I, I love it when people go back, and people are still doing it. They read, they're, they're watching those videos on Revelation, and they'll text me, and they'll say, all right, in Revelation, da, 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 this is what you said, but what about this over here? And I love that. Well, Brother Andy, does that mean they're arguing with you? No. I love commentary going back and forth like that. I'm not going to argue with anybody. But what we've got to realize is we don't need to be afraid of reading the Word of God. We don't need to be afraid of reading Revelation. But we need to understand Revelation and the Word of God within the broader literary context. There's symbolism and there is poetry and there is, there is analogies and there's things in Revelation in particular that you need to Step back and look at the literary context in which the Word of God, including Revelation, is written. Knowing all of that, I want to talk just, just another couple minutes about facing the future. Because that seems like something that a lot of people today are really, really, they're, well, what, what, what do we need to do about facing tomorrow? What do we need to do about facing the future? Are you, are you watching what's going on overseas? I, I, got, I get asked that. Are you watching what's going on in Israel? Yes. But the thing that we've got to understand is I'm not scared about what's going on in Israel. I'm not scared about what's going on in America. I'm watching it because I want to know what's happening. I think we need to know what's happening. But I can face the future with my head held high. Why? Because I know I've got hope. To that end, I want you to take a look. Revelation chapter 1. Take a look at verses 10 through 13 and then 17 and 18. Revelation chapter 1, 10 through 13 and then 17 and 18. It says this. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. By the way, that is, and I'll have, I, can, I can show you in the scripture where this is all out, but that is on Sunday, okay? That's, this is what he's referring to, okay? It is referring to Sunday, our Sunday, the first day of the week. Sunday is the first day of the week. That's what it's referring to. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet saying, write what you see in a book and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, Samaria, Smyrna, excuse me, Smyrna, to, mm -hmm, to Pell City, to Tuscaloosa, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me and on turning, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of one of the in the midst of the lampstands, one like the like a son of man, clothed with a long robe and a golden sash around his chest. And then verse seventeen and eighteen. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last. And the living one, I died. And behold, I am alive forevermore. And have the keys of death and Hades. Go down to look at, uh, flip back in your Bibles to Romans, Romans chapter 6, verse 9 through 12. Romans chapter 6, verse 9 through 12. We know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer 
has dominion over him. I want you to stop right there for just a moment. I want you to think about this. Christ died. He rose from the dead. And look at the last part of that verse. It says, death no longer has dominion over him. Over who? Over Jesus. What does, go all the way back to Genesis, what does Genesis tell us will enter in whenever man, Adam and Eve, eats of the tree in the midst of the garden? What does he say is going to happen? Death. What do we know now, what do we know transpired when Adam and Eve ate of the fruit that was in the midst of the garden on that tree? What do we now call that? We call that sin, right? What is sin? Sin is a separation between man and God, right? What did sin bring in to mankind? Death. What are it, and people will look at it as a physical death. I look at it more of spiritual, a spiritual death. You know, the question has been asked, if Adam and Eve had not have ate of the fruit in the midst of the garden, would we still be living in the garden today? I don't know. When you get to heaven, ask God. Okay, I really don't know the answer to that. I'm sure... Just because I know humanity, I'm sure somewhere or another, somebody would have fallen prey to that serpent. I'm just being real with you. Some way, some way, shape, form, or fashion, if Adam and Eve hadn't have fallen prey to the serpent, the kids might have, the grandkids might have. Somebody would have fallen prey to that serpent, and death would have, or sin would have entered in at some way, shape, form, or fashion. Okay, let's just be real about this thing. But we know that sin, because of sin, death has now entered into the ranks of mankind. I look at it from a spiritual side. I think that there's so many folks that are sitting on the pews today that are breathing in air and they are spiritually dead that they need a resurrection in their life. There are people that are spiritually dead. They need a spiritual resurrection. But look at what Jesus said in verse 9. He says, death, in other words, sin, hello, no longer has dominion over Jesus. What is our verse? What what verse did I quote? It felt like three months on Sunday mornings. Matthew chapter 28 and verse 18. All authority in heaven and in earth has been given unto Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Death no longer has dominion over Jesus. Authority has been given unto whom? Jesus, who is sitting on the right hand of the Father, making intercession for you and I. Jesus, why are we so worried when the devil throws our sin back in our li- in our face, saying, see, God doesn't love you. Look at the sin you got. I'm going to tell you something. We need to take a stand and put our foot on the devil's neck and say, you no longer have dominion over me. Amen. We need to do this. That was just a footnote. Go on. Look at verse 10. <laughs> I like that verse. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all mankind. But the life he lives, he lives for God. We need to live a life for God. Amen? Look at verse 11, I think. Yeah, uh, go, uh, we're going through 12, I'm sorry. So you must. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God. In Christ Jesus, I'm no longer, what's, what's the song? There's a song that says, I'm no longer a slave to sin. I am a child of God. Quit reminding God of your sin. What did Moses do? Moses said, I can't. I cannot be your mouthpiece. I cannot be the vocal cords. I cannot be the mouthpiece. Why? Because of this, 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 and this. God already knew all those things. God chose us for a reason and a purpose. 
We are a chosen people, a royal priesthood. We can face the future. Why? Because God chose me. I can face the future. Why? Because I know regardless of what happens, regardless of what takes place, regardless of the circumstances, regardless of the turmoil, the, fa- the failure, regardless of all the obstacles in life, I can face tomorrow. Why? Because I know who holds my tomorrow. I can face tomorrow because I have considered myself dead to sin but alive to God. In Christ Jesus. But we have so many church folks. Bless their hearts. We're from the south. We know what that really means. Bless them. They want to argue about everything else. They want to argue about... They want to argue because Sister Nellie is sitting on that third row, and that's where I want to sit at. They, 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 she's wearing that black jacket, and I cannot believe that she's wearing that. And Chuck's wearing that red shirt. And that, that red shirt offends me. What does that red shirt got to do with the price of tea in China? What does her black jacket got to do with anything I am not a, I am dying out to sin. I'm not worrying about all those things. I am alive to God through Jesus Christ. I am no longer a slave to sin. I am a child of God. And they ain't go, nobody going to mess with my joy in the Holy Ghost. But we allow that. I see more angry Christians than anything else. Why? Because the preacher didn't even shake my hand. Well, did you go shake his? Come on. I thought I had ticked Brother Emery off one time. We hadn't been here about six months. Eight months. And I got to noticing that Brother Emery... You know, I always would close the service, and I'd go in the foyer, and I'd, I'd shake every, I'd, you know, greeting everybody as they're leaving. Of course, everybody wants to talk to the pastor, which is fine with me. I'll stand in the, I'll sit. Well, I might sit down sometimes, but I'll stand in that foyer till, till the cows come home. I'll talk to everybody. And I got to noticing that Brother Emery never he slipped by, he slipped through, he'd, he'd go on through, and he'd go on to his car. He never, he never said one word to me. I thought, man, that joker, what have I done to him? Y'all, I'll be real with you. I was thinking, I can't take him off. He's writing my check. And I was over at his house one day, and he said, he said, Brother Lambert, I don't know if you've noticed this or not. I noticed everything, okay? He said, I don't know if you noticed this or not, but I just slip out, and I don't, I don't try to talk to you after service. I said, yes, sir, I've noticed that. Do you remember this conversation? Okay, good. I'm, I'm Make sure nobody thinks I'm making this up. <laughs> Life feed, he said it's the truth. But I was over at his house one I don't even remember why I was over at his house. I was over at his house one day, and, and he said, Brother Lambert, I don't know if, you rem- if you've noticed this or not, but I, I slip out, and I don't ever stop and talk to you. And I said, yeah, I've noticed it. He said, well, everybody else wants to talk to you. And I'm just going let to let you and them talk. He said, I figure if me and you've got something we need to talk about, we can talk about it later on during the week. We can talk about it later on that afternoon. We can talk about it some other time later on. Everybody else wants to talk to you. Mate, he, he, I never did tell him that I thought he was just mad at me. I didn't really think he was mad at me. I didn't think Emory could get mad at anybody. But I thought, you know, it made me feel better to know that he was doing that on purpose. Now, there's some people that does it now, and I don't think they follow in Brother Emery's footsteps on that. I'm just going to say, I think they just really just trying to get out from talking to me. But, but, you know, 
the thing about it is, is there's people that get so mad because the preacher didn't even shake my hand. I'm using that from that song. But I've asked people before. I've gone to, I've gone to churches to, to handle squabbles and fights and grumbles. And I literally had a guy stand up in a, in a meeting and, tell, and the, the pastor sitting right there on the front row. I'm standing in front of the congregation. Pastor sitting right there. Joker sitting right there. And, and that was what he was mad at the pastor about. He don't even shake my hand. And I said, Brother Kevin, you should have went there to hold my lip front. Because I let them flap before I thought about it. And I let it let the words come out of my mouth before I realized I said it. And I thought, well, that cat's out of the bag now. I looked him dead eyeball to eyeball. And I said, well, when did you shake his hand? But people get so mad over things when it needs to be about the gospel of Jesus Christ. It ain't about the color of the carpet. It ain't about what the thermostats is set on. I don't know about y'all, but it's gotten a little warm in here. Weather outside, I can't figure it out. Is it hot or cold? I don't know anymore. 80, 29, 80. What did it hit, 82 today? 29 last week? I don't know what to set the thermostats for anymore. I'd already changed them for wintertime, and I'm having to bump the air back on. But here's the thing, people get mad over, over the silliest things. I don't care how significant things are, we need to die out to sin and be alive to God in Jesus Christ. I, I got, we got to go on, I got five minutes. Lord of mercy, I ain't going to never get all this through. Take a look at Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7 verse 9. And I looked. And thrones were placed. And the ancient of day. I love that song. I'm just going to tell you know that. I'm not throwing that a hint to anybody. I love that song. The ancient of days. I really like that song. But. And I, as I looked and thrones were placed. And the ancient of day. Don't you go tell my wife I said that. Sister Deborah. You're gonna, yeah, get, Sister Carrie's going to go over to Sister Deborah's house. And she's going to. Brother Andy's wanting us to learn this song. I, or, or sing this song. I didn't say that. I just, I like that song. Anyway, we go on. As I looked, thrones were placed. I'm saying that because they've got songs lined out for the next several weeks. I'm not. As I looked, and thrones were placed, and the Ancient of Days took his seat, and his clothing was white as snow, and the hair of his head was unlike Pastor Andy's because it was pure, it was like pure wool. His throne was flame, was fiery flames. Its wheels was burning fire. Go on down to Revelation 5, verses 1 through 6. I'm, I'm showing you correlations here, okay? Revelation 5, 1 through 6. I saw in the right hand of him who was seated on the throne a scroll written within and on the back sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and to break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. And I began to weep loudly. John says, I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. I like this part. Watch this. And one of the elders said, Dry it up, boy. Weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, the king of kings, the lord of lords, the prince of peace, the rose of Sharon, the bright and the morning star, the alpha and the omega, the first, the last, the beginning and the end, the one that was, that is, and is to come. He is conquered, and he is able, and he can open the scroll and its seven seals. Verse 6, And between the throne and the four living creatures among the elders, 
I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain. Think about that for just a second. Let that resonate in your imagination of your mind. I saw a lamb as though it had been slain. Standing. That, that contradicts itself, doesn't it? You know what? Jesus contradicts all of what mankind thinks. Mankind says it can't be done. Jesus says, oh, yes, it can. Mankind says sickness is going to take you out of this world. Jesus says, oh, no, it ain't. Why? Because I'm the great physician. Hello? Jesus, man, mankind says it's never going to happen. Jesus says, oh, watch me do it. Hello? Mankind says it'll never take place. Jesus says, oh, just sit down and watch me work. Hello? You know, it ain't comical, but it's comical. I remember I was standing on First Baptist steps. First Baptist Church's steps whenever the, 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 the tower out in the in the mill village smokestack when that tower and they 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 placed them dynamites into that into that thing they they said it was all unstable and they placed them dynamites into it and I was sta- I wished I'd have videoed it because they they put I mean they was it, they was a long time putting dynamite in that thing they drilled holes. They done all their stuff. They placed dynamite, and they 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 going they gonna blow that dynamite, and that tower's just gonna go. Whip, whoop. Everything's done. Five minutes is gonna be done. No. They lit they 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 they, they lit that dynamite, and it went literally. I, I mean, I've watched enough westerns. I know what dynamite's supposed to sound like. It sounded more powerful on them westerns that I've watched at Jay Adams' house than it did on than it did there because it went pop. And they supposed to be smoke a mile high. And it went pop. And there was just a little bit of smoke. And I was thinking, man, that that that, that ain't as unstable as they thought it was. And, and the guy on the backhoe, he gets on the backhoe, and he's like, you watch me take this thing down. He brought it down all right on top of his own head. He did. I was sitting there watching it. I was thinking, oh, Lord Jesus. They're going to have to go, go uncover, uh, uncover him. He died. <laughs> he didn't. But, you know, that's, that's sort of what I'm thinking there, you know, is – I, I see that, and I'm not trying to be a heretic. I'm not trying to be uh, disrespectful or anything like that. But it's almost like them dynamites is there, and they're like, okay, watch this tower fall, and it didn't fall. He says, oh, yeah, I'm fixing to bring that tower down. He starts getting that, that tractor, and he's like, I'm taking this tower down. But I told a friend of mine that was next door, I told him, standing right beside me, I said, you know what they really need to do to get that tower down? If they would, if they would get... And this ain't being ugly, this ain't being offensive. If they'd get a few rednecks that's got four-wheel drive trucks, give, each a, give them a pack of hot dogs and a bag of tater chips, and tell them, if y'all bring that tower down, you get another pack of hot dogs, I promise you it wouldn't have took all that a long amount of time. And, and they'd have saved a lot of money. That's what I see when I look at this verse. It says, it says, uh, what, what was it, verse 5? Was it verse 5 I said? Oh, yeah. Weep no more, because here's come, here he comes. He's going to open the scroll and the seven seals that is sealed, that scroll. Finally, verse 6. And between the throne and the four elders, among the elders I saw a lamb standing as though he'd been slain with seven horns, seven eyes, Seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. You know what? The lion, Jesus, proved himself worthy to break the seals and open the scroll. By living a perfect life, Jesus Christ is pictured as both a lamb and a lion. The lamb symbolizing his submission to God's will and the lion symbolizing his authority and his power. John 
saw the lamb as it had been slain. The wounds inflicted on Jesus' body during the trial and the crucifixion. Jesus was called the Lamb of God by John the Baptist. In the Old Testament, lambs were sacrificed to cover the sins. And the Lamb of God died as the final sacrifice for all sins of all mankind. Last thing, John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. How are we supposed to face the future? We face the future knowing that God loved me enough to send his only begotten son I can face the future knowing God's got this. It looks bad. It looks ugly. God's got this. God's got us in the palm of his hand. Just always remember, there is a spiritual warfare going on. But God's got this. Would you bow your heads and let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, again as we come to you today, thank you for the blessings that you've given us. Thank you for this opportunity that you've allowed us to come into your house to worship and praise you. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for allowing us to know how we can face the future. I thank you that through the Son, your Son, Jesus Christ, we can die out to sin, but we're alive through him. We're alive through Christ. It doesn't matter what's going on in the world around us. It doesn't matter what's going on in our own state, our own town, our own county. But what does matter is you're the Son of God. Jesus Christ is the Son of God who died to take take away the sins of the world. I'm so thankful for that. And God, I praise you for what you've done in our lives and what you're going to continue to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And amen. Live feed, thank you so much for being with us. Join us Sunday school, Sunday morning at 945, and worship at 11. May the good Lord bless you as our prayer. Amen. And amen.